have another minute to go or so. Welcome everybody from wherever you are around the world. The last couple of times I've done um, Zoom webinars, it's been kind of fun. We've had them from South Africa, France, Australia, which I think right now is a very late time in Australia, <laughs> actually. Um, a couple places in Europe, it's been very nice to be able to do this. Um, Danielle is going to, my co-host Danielle, uh, managing editor at Forward, is going to be keeping an eye on the chat. So if you have questions, please post them there. We've also asked everybody to um, do us a favor and let us know what kind of project you're working on, um, fiction or nonfiction, children, adults, that gives us a feel for the room, so to speak, uh, and better answer your questions and spend a little bit of time on other issues if needed. Um, she may interrupt her program uh, because she's, I'm basically gonna hand things off to her in a little while to um, answer some of the questions or we'll hold off to the end and answer them as well. I'm also going to um, share our email addresses at the end of the um, session so that you can email us and we are recording. Um, we'll share the recording with their, our friends at Bowker, and they are going to um, share that with you as well as, as long as um, it'll be, a, it might be a couple of days before that happens though. So thanks in advance for your patience. Um, anyway, my name is Victoria Sutherland. I'm the publisher of Forward Reviews Magazine and Forward Magazine Incorporated. Um, Danielle Ballantyne is our managing editor. She joined us a couple of years ago um, to head up our editing department, actually. And uh, at about the same time, we started a partnership with Bowker. The folks at Bowker have been very kind to us, letting us um, uh, host some of these webinars to give you a kind of a deep dive into uh, what editing is and why it matters. And um, uh, hopefully you get a, learn a lot out of uh, the presentation today. Um, a little bit of uh, information about Danielle. She's um, got an English language and literature degree. She moved to New York City um, to start a career in publishing there, uh, working at Tor Books. And then uh, after she came to Michigan, she joined our team uh, just before, no, it was a year before we had our homebound uh, remote work situation. <laughs> yep. And um, I founded the magazine in 1998 with a couple of other women, both of whom have gone on to one is married to a New York Times bestselling author. The other is a New York Times bestselling author. So I feel like we have some good cred um, in, the, in our background. Um, I have a, a Bachelor of Arts degree in advertising and communications from Michigan State. I have um, almost completed my master's, but at the same time I started this company, I started uh, my master's program, so it didn't work out for me to finish. Um, but I have gone to all the, NY, the, the publishing courses at NYU, Yale, Stanford, and um, I also have some agenting experience um, but I uh, just want to go over what, with you what we're going to cover today and then pass the baton to Danielle to talk about um, her experiences in the field, um, why you should hire an editor, some common mistakes she sees, the different types of editing, some proofreading tips. Uh, she's pulled together a couple samples of what uh, editing job might look like and also give you some coaching guidance about uh, things to consider when you're hiring an editor. So with that, Danielle, I'm gonna mute myself and uh, let you take it away from here. Okay. All right, um, so starting off with why you'd hire an editor. Um, first of all, editors are aware of industry standards and may have access to resources authors do not. Um, this includes style manuals, uh, certain editing software and things like that, that you could get access to yourself. Um, but a lot of them are, you have to pay for that or pay for a subscription. It's either once or yearly or monthly. Um, they're more likely to have access to that sort of thing. A fresh set of eyes, eyes provides objectivity. Um, I think we, we've all, you know, you finish the email and then as soon as you hit send, you see something wrong with it. And that's just because you're used to reading it. Uh, so getting that uh, fresh set of eyes eliminates that sort of familiarity element. 
editing software has its limits. I, I know, again, it's something I'm sure it's happened to all of us. It's either Google Docs or it's Microsoft Word, and it's suggesting you change something, and it just doesn't make sense. And if you just went through and went with every little red line underneath something, you're going to end up with something a little weird. Uh, so an editor will actually be reading through it and making the appropriate changes um, and changing words to, you know, not just the closest correct spelling, but what you actually intended, things like that. Um, and it also provides more confidence when submitting your work, just having someone else go through it, uh, whether that's a copy edit or a developmental edit, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, just having someone else have read it and I looked over the grammar or given you some feedback on your plot and things like that. It just gives you that that little boost um, when sending it off for a publishing company or something else to read it. Okay, so just a quick overview yeah. of a few types of common mistakes, um, which is I think the slide back actually from this one. Okay, I have it myself. Um, inconsistent verb tenses. This one is very, very common. Uh, you know, you're switching from present tense to past tense, either in the same sentence, same paragraph. Uh, there's certainly some stylistic wiggle room, but there is a point when it stops making sense and an editor can, can find those for you. Um, another one is missing additional or repeated words. This happens a lot when, say, you adjust a sentence, uh, but don't go back and read through the whole thing again. So you end up with like a little mix and match of a couple different things you intended. Uh, we also have incorrect subject verb agreements. This is really just whether you need an S or not, essentially. It's a little more complicated than that, but we've all run into that. We're like, I don't know. And you got to go back and find the noun that it's agreeing with. And it's just, it can get pretty complicated. And then costume changes. Now, this is just sort of my generic term for really anything that magically appears or disappears or changes um, sort of spontaneously. You know, your character walks in carrying a coffee cup and then later on they catch something. It's like, wait, well, what happened to the coffee cup? And if you're just writing through, you might not quite be following along with those details because you're focused on the story. Um, so that's another one that, that happens a lot. And sometimes it's small, you know, sometimes it's a coffee cup and sometimes it's an actual literal someone's wearing a different outfit spontaneously, which is again, a lot of remnants from earlier drafts and things is where a lot of these things will pop up. Uh, incorrect, inconsistent capitalization. Proper nouns are hard. They just are. If you're not 100% confident in, in what you're doing and even, I mean, really it would be somewhat egotistical of me to suggest I'm 100% confident, but I just pop into my Chicago manual of style and look it up. Uh, but there, there is a lot of uh, times when it's just confusing, especially when you're getting into government or military terminology, uh, where you do want uh, someone who has that style guide uh, that can access some of that information for you. And then dialogue and paragraph formatting. Uh, just where to put the quotation marks, where to put the punctuation within the quotation marks. When do I need a new paragraph? When should I have a new paragraph just for readability? Um, a lot of those things that that's a, also a very, very common one, especially when you're dealing with dialogue and mm. switching speakers and things like that. Okay, so just these are the types of editing. We're gonna go through them in more detail. You can get a developmental edit, a copy edit, or a proofreading. You can't get proofreading with us, um, which I'll explain why as we dive into them a little bit uh, more, but they all mean slightly different things and it can be very confusing. <laughs> so a developmental edit, um, this is sort of big picture. It's gonna deal with things like narrative structure, pacing, reader satisfaction, plot continuity. Well, I mean, you can read it out to read it to you. Um, <laughs> these are global, we call global issues and global just means throughout the entirety of the manuscript. Um, so this is where you're gonna want this edit if you are open to these changes. And that's really the most important thing when talking about a relationship between an editor and an author 
you have to know what kind of edit you are open to because your developmental editor could very well say, you know, I, I don't think the ending works. Let's, let's do something completely different. And you have to be open to those sorts of big picture global changes. And that's where the communication and collaboration and the sooner the better comes in with this because you really want someone there fairly early on. You still need to be open to those sorts of big changes. Um, they're not going to be able to write it for you, obviously. We're not talking about a like a ghost writer or an, there's like an story coach or something like that that would help you from the get-go. You want a fairly solid first draft, but you want to be open. You want this to still be malleable. Um, and you can ask questions. This is a situation where you would want to be asking those sorts of questions. Like, do you think this scene works? What do you think of this character? How do you feel about the ending? You can have those conversations at, at this stage with a developmental edit and you'll get honest feedback and you can come up with maybe something that would work better, things like that. And that's why you want to be getting this, again, after you have a fairly finished first draft, but really the sooner the better you can loop in a developmental editor. Um, that'll be more beneficial for both of you because you want that feedback. And then if you're so far along and, and no longer open to a lot of these changes, or if you're like within a series, it's also sort of difficult to jump into the middle of an ongoing series of novels or what they may be and give them a developmental edit because you're kind of locked in to certain changes that you cannot make. Uh, so the sooner you, the better for looping in a developmental editor. Mm. Okay, and then we have a copy edit. This is probably the one that you'd be most familiar with. Um, this is grammar, spelling, punctuation. It's pretty standard bare bones kind of stuff. You're not going to get a lot of that other feedback on continuity and plot and you know reader satisfaction. They're not going to be telling you a lot of that. Um, they're going to look at consistent style and formatting, uh, say, half of it's double spaced and half of it's single spaced. Um, they'll be putting in paragraph breaks and things like that. Um, but it will be a matter of whether it is correct or incorrect. They're not going to be giving you really their opinion so much. Um, this can include line editing, which is a slightly different thing. I know it's sometimes used synonymously. But line editing deals more specifically with word choice, syntax, and overall sentence flow. Um, so they might, you know, move sections of the sentence here or there just for clarity or for, you know, readability or things like that. Um, this is what you would do when it's it's done. You just want like a final polish. You're you don't want to make these big picture changes. You don't want opinions on your story or anything else. You just want someone to, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's before you send it off. And then proofreading. This is also sometimes lumped into copy editing, but in, in that case, it's really a mistake to lump them together because proofreading is that very, very final thing. It's really someone who goes in right before it goes to print and make sure that nothing has gone wrong. Um, which can happen sometimes when you're switching things into platforms um, or when the interior designer lays out the text. Sometimes words are broken in the wrong place, things like that. Um, it's still very important because, you know, I think if we any of us have copied and pasted anything, you know, sometimes like everything's in italics or nothing's in italics anymore. Stuff like that um, is what your proofreader at the very, very end is going to catch. It's not always a separate service. If you were going through a more traditional publishing outlet, this would all be folded in together. Like they would likely do this for you. Um, but it is the very, very last thing that anyone is gonna do with your manuscript and then it's gonna go to the printer. So if, if your proofreader misses it, well, there you go. You'll get a reader email. <laughs> So because the proofreading process is, it, it's after everything and it's not usually something that someone will offer separately just because it's so minimal, it's probably something you'll be doing yourself. 
either after you've got a copy edit um, or just, you know, you're confident enough and this is, you're about to send it off to whoever it may be and you want to go through. So the number one thing you want to do is really just take your time. It, you can't sit down. Like if you were reading it like a novel, like it wasn't yours, like you weren't doing it to look for mistakes, you could probably do it in two, three hours, but that isn't what you're doing. It's going to be, there's a lot of like brain fatigue that goes on with this sort of thing. So take your time. And if you think you're going to find all of the mistakes the first time through, you're not. Um, I know when I'm doing a developmental edit, which for us sort of includes the functions of a copy edit, and then those additional considerations, I read it through twice. Um, because I can't think about big picture story while I'm thinking about, you know, the T's and the I's. I just can't. Uh, so take your time and you're going to have to read it through multiple times. And it's actually very helpful to read it out loud. Uh, it slows down. It increases your focus when having to read it through out loud. Um, I know I, I did that all the way through college and a lot of what I said didn't make any sense when I had to hear it. Uh, so that's also very helpful. Uh, doing it in sections, I and mean, this is sort of linked to taking your time, but just, you know, you don't have to get all the way through that chapter or stop at chapter six or whatever it is. Um, just whenever you can feel yourself kind of like glazing over and just reading it like it's a magazine article, stop and take a break, drink some water, you know, just, just take your time with it. And if you become aware of say some, and maybe you already are, I know a lot of writers already are, you, you kind of know your common foibles, so to speak. Um, so just be aware of that. You know, sometimes that's something that you can, you know, control F or whatever your keyboard shortcut is for searching a document and look up a particular word that you know you've had trouble spelling or maybe a character name that you changed at some point and you're not sure if you've caught all of them. You can look for those things either within functions in the document or just be aware, you know, like I know I have a hard time with verb tenses, so I'm going to do like maybe even it's a separate read through where that is all you look for. Um, but yeah, the proofreading process, it's, it's going to be more time consuming than you think it is. It just is. Um, but it, it's definitely something that if you're willing to take the time that you can do. Okay, so now we have some sample edits. Um, gosh, they're teeny, teeny, tiny for me. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, okay. So this is more what you're going to be dealing with. Um, most of these things are copy editing sorts of changes. You're looking at adding commas, um, adding in connecting words. Um, looks like there's a verb agreement there. Obviously, the actual text has to be blurred out here because it's a sample manuscript um, and there's you know, someone else's work. Um, <laughs> but we wanted you to see sort of the kinds of things that you'd be getting. Um, the comment about the, the mother there, the second one from the bottom, about a character sort of disappearing halfway through the scene, that's not something that your copy editor would be considering. It's something that you need a, a developmental edit or something more extensive than a copy edit to be looking, because that's a continuity issue, of course. Um, so those are just some examples, or our first sample at least, of the kinds of changes you would get. And then it's also a way to see, this is out of Google Docs, um, but in Microsoft Word and I, I think Pages, I'm not sure what it's called. I know Microsoft Word, it's track changes, Google Docs, it's suggestions. Um, but this is how we make all of the changes and, and how probably as you see fit. Okay. I lost you for a minute. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. Did you want to see the second page too? Oh, I can. Okay. <laughs> okay. So second page here. Obviously that top comment is again, the kind of thing that you're going to be getting from a developmental edit. Um, 
And then the rest of them are again, copy edits. And you can see at the bottom there of the sample, I know it's blurry, but it's highlighted in yellow. And that's how comments pop up in these sort of things. So your editor can highlight a section, add a comment. And so the highlighted sections in a manuscript that you get back, you can click on those and it will pop immediately up the comment that is associated with that. So that's another really useful feature especially when it comes to developmental edits, um, because of course, copy editing, just there's fewer things to comment on. Okay, so things to consider when hiring your particular editor. Do they have experience? That can mean really whatever is most important to you. If you want them to have experience in the genre, um, if you want them to have a certain level of experience with maybe something particular, like military style guides or things like that, which they, they do actually have their own style guide. Um, so that can mean really whatever. You can ask those questions, especially in the hiring stage. You, like, you can ask most questions. Are they familiar with your genre? This may be important to you. It may not. Um, it sort of depends just on, that's a very personal preference. Uh, will they use a style guide? You wanna know, uh, first of all, whether they're using one at all, and then you wanna know which style guide it is. For the publishing industry, sort of your standard, anything that's gonna come out of a publishing house that isn't specified. So like it's, um, I know like psychology, anything like medical, uh, some English departments, it depends. Uh, but there's certain disciplines that have specific style guides that they will use. And you'll wanna make sure that you are using the correct one for wherever you're intending to publish it. So your you know, nonfiction paper, you're probably gonna be looking at APA. Um, but for just about any, any fiction um, and then self-help memoirs, things like that, it's probably gonna be in Chicago. So you wanna be sure that your editor is using the correct style guide and especially that they're using one at all. What sort of technology does your editor use? Um, first of all, you wanna make sure that it's, it's on the same platform as you or that you have access in some way to that file format. Um, and then just whatever you're most familiar with, whatever you're comfortable with. If you don't like Google Docs or if you, you know, maybe there's an internet issue there or something. So getting like the Microsoft Word file, like I'm more comfortable with that. So you want to be asking those sorts of questions. Um, how will they deliver feedback? This could be a matter of, of track changes, you know, whether they're putting them in directly and you can't see what they've changed or haven't or whether they're using those functions in a word processor. Um, or what, just whether they're going to give you larger scale feedback or not. Um, I know we have on both of our types of edits, developmental edit and copy edit, we also offer summary comments, which do lean more developmental edit. There was some debate, but we ended up saying that we will include it for the copy edit too, because it's not that much more work and these things can be helpful. Um, but if you want a sort of big picture, you know, you want to know what they think of the ending or something, you should check whether that's something that they're going to be considering, whether that's included in whatever kind of edit you're getting from them. Um, and then will they be delivering that sort of feedback, you know, in say like a separate section or should you be looking through the comments or just questions like that? Um, how will they determine what type of edit is needed? It's, this could be something that you talk about like it could be folded right in to the type of edit that you purchase from them. And then that's quite clear probably, or some people just, you know, you send it off and they might just do whatever they're going to do with it. And if you do have specific needs that you want addressed or specific concerns you want addressed, that is, is also a conversation that you should have early on. And then what will their costs be? Some people do it by words, some people by character, some people it's hourly. You just want to be you know, very upfront, very clear about that. Um, Cause it's, you know, you're, you're sending your manuscript off to someone. And of course that's, it's not published. You know, you're, it's, it's scary. The whole thing's just a little nerve wracking. 
Uh, so you want to be sure that the pricing is clear up front and then that everybody, you know, is mutually respected and respectful in that interaction um, that everyone gets, you know, compensated for their work, but nobody feels like the rug's been pulled out from under them at the end. Danielle, do you want to um, mention how we determine, I mean, some people ask you for developmental, some people ask you for copy, but we do a um, sample uh, pages, correct? And then let them know what we think they might need if they, if they ask. Yeah, if you do email for us, at least, um, you could email, I believe it's my email address that's on the bottom of our editing page. Um, you could email and either just a general query, sort of like, here's where I'm at in the process. What do you think I need? Um, or like send some sample pages, send the whole thing, whatever it is. Um, and you can ask like, what kind of edit do you think I need? And I mean, we'll tell you, I mean, at that point, it, it's just an email. It's not the kind of thing, you know, it's not a lawyer, right? I'm not like going to charge you for the time it took me to type out this email. Um, and I think most, most editors are like that, you know, it's, it's about building a relationship. I think for, for most people, at least if you're dealing with an individual person, not someone who's folded into the process at a publishing house who you'll probably never know the name of, it is about building a relationship and building a rapport. Uh, so it's totally fine to ask, ask those sorts of questions um, and send out those emails. Uh, you, you do, of course, want to be careful because you are sending out something unpublished. Um, and it, it's copyrighted in the sense that it's your intellectual property. But that, that's very difficult um, down the line if they were to, you know, steal it. Um, but you just want to make sure you're dealing with, with someone reputable before you go sending out the whole manuscript and asking for, you know, um, some free advice. Uh, we did just have a question pop up as to whether um, editors sign NDAs normally. I've never heard of it. Um, I'm sure it's possible. I'm sure it's somewhere someone does it. But no, I've, I've never. There's, a, of course, if you're dealing with like larger companies and things like that, or even individuals, there's, there's like employment contracts and things like that that would be folded into a traditional publishing house, you know, where there's, you know, those like bad behavior termination clauses, essentially. And there's an understanding that everything shared within here is confidential. Um, but no, as for going the distance to have an editor specifically sign an NDA, uh, no, that's not something that's commonly done. Any other questions that you see that we should address? Do Nope. Okay, we can do the rest at the end if they come up to. Did you want me to jump in here and talk about um, our service so you could take a little break? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier on in the programming here, um, but we started this service in 2019 because um, we saw a lot of review titles coming in for submissions that were not being very well edited. And we knew um, that we couldn't review them because of so many common grammatical errors, but also that it was hard to find good editors or where do you even look for good editors. Um, so when we uh, thought about putting this program together, we also had a meeting with uh, the people at Bowker who were interested in our FIFA review services, Clarion, and we thought we'd um, add the editing services as well, because most of the people who are coming to Bowker are just getting their ISBN numbers and, and that was a good time for them to uh, start looking for help with editing and find out what the industry was, you know, what was necessary to get their book published. Um, we also had um, a lot of, you know, we have some cred because we are forward and we have um, some trust uh, built with librarians and booksellers and rights agents who know that we are gonna do a good job and uh, people who were interested in an editing service could get um, that from us. And we also could provide um, competitive pricing. Um, so there's, you know, you, you have to be careful when you're selecting editors, as, as Danielle mentioned. Um, part, part of it is what their background is, where they, if, you know, they have reviews of their service that you can check to see what other people, um, who they worked with, how they felt about their project afterwards. And so it's important for you to do your homework um, when you're hiring editing uh, services, uh, particularly from 
people you are just, just you know getting off the internet. Um, we have put together, this is on our website, um, but it will just give you an idea of some of the things that um, you would you will get with a developmental and a copy edit. And I think Danielle went over this pretty formally um, in previous slides, uh, but there's the pricing and there is, um, it's much less money, of course, to just have a standard copy edit than developmental edit, but um, we like to see where you stand with your book before we make, um, and you may send uh, just sign up for copy editing. And I think Danielle will very um, kindly tell you that it could use a developmental edit if you could um, spare the time and extra expense. And I, I just can't begin to tell you how important it is to be, begin your project with doing things the right way. Don't gloss over artwork or interior design or editing because after you've spent so much time putting this you know, masterpiece together to have it fall to pieces and not get, you know, seen by libraries, booksellers, or other readers because you didn't um, spend a little bit of extra time or money to, to get it done properly packaged um, is really just too bad. It would be a shame for that to happen. Uh, did, oh, that was quick. So, in summary, um, you know, after self-editing, the first step of the process is an editorial review to determine what kind you of, of editing that you might need. There are several different types that we've gone over today and you won't need them all, but some of you will. And we just want you to be careful um, with who you hire. We recommend that you do a little bit of research and background checks on them and find reviews of their services so that you aren't disappointed in the project. Um, and there's a lot of stuff happening at the same time. You know, you're working on your cover and the interior is about to be sent to a, um, a, a designer. Um, but this is, a, this is essential at the beginning of your project to, to keep in mind. Um, so I hope that uh, we hit home at that point. I also wanted to mention that we um, have email, or I did mention at the beginning, here's our email addresses. We may not have answered a couple of your questions. We're gonna stay on for a little while, obviously longer um, to, to answer them, but copy down our emails. You might think of something tonight that didn't occur to you today. And we're happy to answer questions um, after the fact from for a couple of days. It's just our names with forwardreviews.com afterwards. <laughs> but I also wanted to um, note that, uh, let's see, go the other way. Here we go. Um, Bowker is offering a discount for um, editorial services for participants in this seminar today. You need to use the promo code editor when you check out, and you also have to order this out at their website, myidentifiers.com. They usually offer this um, only for a week afterwards, and they're going to send a follow-up email, I imagine. I don't know if um, Richard or uh, Andrew are online. They can confirm this uh, in the chat session, but um, they want you to act sooner rather than later um, in order to take advantage of this opportunity. So. Um, please do um, at the myidentifiers.com site. I'm going to stop this share. Okay, there we go. Oh, there's some Q&As. Yeah, we got um, Q&A and also the chat. Um, I, we can see both of them, so you can drop your question in either of them. Um, we've got a couple already. Um, do you also connect authors to agents? No, <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, an agent, you'll, you'll have to find that yourself. And if you want an agent before you go to a publishing house, um, we do editing and we have the magazine, but we don't publish, print, go through all of that um, with your book. But please, please, if you are going through a publishing house that does all of that, please get an agent and get it early. You, you, you need that advocate in there. Um, you really do. So that it's very important, but no, that's not something that we, um, that we provide. Um, we have a question about the collaborative process um, between an author and a developmental editor, um, and then what the final delivery looks like. 
Uh, of course, the final delivery is going to be different. Uh, that's another one of those things you, you'd want to talk about, you know, what file format you're getting it in, whether it's going to be sort of a back and forth conversation the whole time or just sort of send it to me. I will finish it. I will send it back. Um, and then the collaborative process, that can be as extensive or as limited as you want, really. Um, you know, sometimes I, authors just send it to me and I send it back. And then other times I send it back and then there's a bit of a back and forth. And this can go on, you know, it can just be a handful of questions. I've had it go on for months, honestly, just back and forth. And then what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Um, so it, it's really up to you. Um, then we have, what advice do you have for someone doing self-publishing? Uh, well, truly this is... Um, self-publishing isn't even such a simple term anymore because uh, there's a lot of services that sort of you know they handle the distribution um, they'll handle even the editing uh, it just depends on sort of which which company you're going through um, but in in the purest sense of you know you put everything together and then you format into an in eh, format into an ebook and throw it up on amazon uh, you just want to have someone checking all of that along the way. Um, maybe that's a skill set that you have that you're confident in, you know, either the editing or the interior formatting or the cover art or whatever. Um, but then whatever is not something that you have in your wheelhouse, just make sure it's done right. Um, Cause you know, as much as we like to say, you don't judge a book by its cover or all these other little things, it's not true about people and it's less true about books. Uh, so just make sure um, that you take your time and find the best resources. And there's a lot of, you know, freelance websites these days, like, you know, Fiverr, uh, which is just Fiverr without the E, um, that can help you with some of those smaller things like interior formatting or uh, Book Baby and places like that do, you know, design, interior design. Um, they might even have graphic artists now, I'm not sure. But um, just want to make sure that all of it's done uh, well. Um, I'll, but I'll again, just jump in on this too, Danielle, because I've been um, working with author publishers or self publishers for 21 years that Forward's been in business. And people want to find a way for you to, I mean, they're looking for a bad thing. They, you know, reviewers or because you self published, it's even harder. The onus on you is even more than a regular publisher, even though they make the same mistake. So I would only uh, co co corroborate what Danielle said is why not come out with, you know, your best book ever. And that's why editing is just as important for author publishers as it is for um, traditionally published mm -hmm. books. Hey, and then we have, um, what's the standard timeline for a copy edit? Uh, ours is two weeks, um, one week if it's expedited. Uh, that's not offered through Bowker, um, the expedited version that is, that you have to order directly through our website. Um, but that's, that's probably pretty standard. If anything, I think it's a little shorter, but that one is shorter because our developmental edit is three weeks and so having that um, difference in, in the timelines is helpful just to put things in the queue and make sure everything gets done um, and can be paid the close attention to that it deserves. Uh, then we have another question. How do memoirs fit in with all of this? Uh, they're, they're just, I mean, it's just nonfiction. Um, you know, we do literary nonfiction, um, by which I mean anything that's not an academic paper. Um, so it's, it's all, it's all the same. Um, all the advice is the same. It's all just as applicable. Um, and we have another question. What is the best time or month rather to publish a book? There's, there's a certain set of, of people who will say that there's certain times that you want to publish certain types of books. I'm not sure if that matters so much anymore, other than like, obviously if it's Halloween theme, you don't want to do it in April. Um, but I think we're drifting more away now from this idea of like, you know, summer thrillers or summer romances or, you know, autumn, winter mystery. Kind of, I don't know if those things are so cut and dry anymore. Um, just as accessibility has gotten so much bigger, you know, you have Kindle and things like that now. Um, so there isn't really one particular time other than, you know, maybe take into account the season or whatever it is that it is in your book. And if that's a significant part of the plot, you know, one of those like New York City is a character kind of things, then 
if spring is a character in your book, then maybe try to aim for that um, just to catch the zeitgeist. Um, can we recommend a good, yeah, printing company? No, we cannot. Um, does the book get re-edited by the publishing house editors? In all likelihood, yes. It depends on which one you were going through. Um, but the idea of a publishing house is sort of, you know, everything is in house. Um, so they would in all likelihood run it through at least a copy editor and a proofreader in all likelihood. Um, but you, you'd have to be um, in a pretty, one of the, big five maybe to get a developmental edit in, in a lot of cases, that's not something that's going to be done as extensively at a lot of the smaller publishing houses, smaller press. Um, but it, it, it really just depends um, on what exactly the process that they're going to put it through, but they will definitely have someone look over it in some capacity before, you know, they stamp their seal on it and send it to print. Um, do need advice. What about workbooks? I have a work. I'm not. Is that a type of computer? I, like, I don't know. Um, okay, memoirs written in narrative style. That's that's an interesting question. Um, I, I suppose I feel like most of them are. Um, but I suppose it depends on what you mean. In like a third person sort of sense, you know, where you're like out, outside of yourself. I suppose so long as it's clear would be my concern there, whether it's clear that it's fiction versus a memoir, um, because that's going to be not, not an issue in editing it. Um, apart from, you know, your editor's not going to want to recommend you make changes on things that actually happen. But that would just be an issue with, uh, with clarity, um, especially for cataloging and categorizing where it goes, um, which is going to be more of an issue for distribution. But yeah, all of the advice, everything would, from an editing perspective, would play out the same with that. Um, and then we have a question about upfront payment. That's certainly, um, that's certainly a risk, especially, I mean, the service mentioned here is Readsy. Um, you're going to have a similar problem with Fiverr, a lot of these sort of freelance rooted sites. Um, and, but a lot of them also offer, you know, they offer reviews, there's testimonials, things like that. You just, you got to do your, your research. Um, and then you want to make sure that there's someone else, like whether that's, you know, Reedsy or whether it's Fiverr or whatever, there's some overarching umbrella here that you can contact because if it's just you and you know someone at hotmail.com there there's no one to to reach out to when that falls through um so just doing doing your research uh is good and upfront payment yeah it it ha it certainly has its risks but to not do it then is putting someone else in a vulnerable position so there's not really it, it's sort of a win lose or a lose win um with with that sort of thing uh, books based on a true story, but is, I assume that's supposed to be fiction. Um, if there's any element of it that is not true, um, there's maybe little room for embellishment or, or something. Um, if, but if it's, you know, those like based on a true story, like we've all seen those horror movies or what have it, right. Where it's like, is it though? <laughs> like, hmm. So that would, that would go through as fiction. Again, it wouldn't really matter from an editing perspective, but you booksellers and librarians and, and whatnot, publishing houses can't market something as nonfiction if there's even elements of it that are fictionalized because it's, well, it's no longer nonfiction. That's sort of an all or nothing sort of consideration. Okay, I'm, I'm not add, any more um, questions. Andrew did note that the deadline, the 10% deadline would be extended through October 4th. So again, go to the Bowker site, myidentifier.com in order to order this service. And if you have any further questions for Danielle or I, the um, email addresses are our first names and forward reviews at forwardreviews.com. 
I just want to take a quick minute. Thank you, Danielle. You're always so great at these. And also thank our partners at Bowker for giving us an opportunity to um, shed a little bit of light on helping make authors and uh, smaller publishers more professional. Um, it makes a big difference. I've, I've heard James Don, a lot of people speak in the, in the industry say, you know, just we, we don't mean to be harsh, but it's important for us to be frank. If your book doesn't measure up, it's not going to get shelf space. And that's really just the bottom line. They, they can't, and we, we can't with the review services, invite people to um, have their books get a good review if it's, if it's not done well. So um, this is your first bit of homework that you have to do after all the time you spent putting it together. Uh, don't drop the ball <laughs> on the end parts, which is the interior design, the cover design, the editing process, because it could really make or break your book. And with that, we thank you all for joining us and spending some time uh, this afternoon uh, from wherever you are. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>